morning, I'm Suzanne Crosby, co-chair, along with Bob Lesler of Council. And welcome. Uh, Norwich United Church Council met on Monday, November 8th, via Zoom. And the following are a few highlights of that meeting. Reverend Janice opened with a prayer, and the original stewards of the land were, on which we were meeting, were acknowledged. After discussion of regulations and new protocols from Southwest Public Health, Southwestern Public Health, concerning places of worship, and keeping in mind our message of open doors and open hearts, a motion was passed that Norwich United Church would not require proof of vaccination for those attending regular Sunday services. We will continue with our sanitization, our contact tracing, screening at the door, and social distancing. Moving on to the administration report, it was noted that the engineer's report has been received with information concerning building repairs. It was moved that a congregational meeting be organized to discuss the report hear options, and answer any questions you may have. And that would be by the engineers or by the um, property committee, the mini committee. The meeting must be announced in church a minimum, minimum of two weeks before the set date, so that will give us three notices. Um, so, a meeting has been scheduled for after our Sunday service on November 28th in the sanctuary. The trustees must report on an annual basis concerning the trustees' holdings. This report was presented to Council with a notation that our financial resources have improved due to growth in the value of investments as well as donations. The next trustee meeting was scheduled and did happen on November 11th. Finally, it was agreed that we will once again proceed with our annual Christmas Day dinner with all the trimmings. Like last year, it will be takeout with delivery available. So watch for further details on that in the upcoming weeks. So these have been a few of the things that we did discuss at Council on Monday evening. And this report will go up on the bulletin board down in the entryway, as well as the minutes are always there as well. So they won't show up until after they're approved at our next meeting. And then you can find November's meetings or minutes then. So we're going to move on now to our announcements that are in the bulletin, which can be picked up on the back table, or they are also in your uh, e-announcements. Something I'd like to highlight is the Shepherding Elders will be meeting with our minister, Janice, after the service on Sunday, November 21st to review lists and share ideas for being effective in the present circumstances. We hope to have coffee and a light lunch available. No? Coffee we'll have available. Okay. Yep. And if they tell us we can't have coffee by that point, we won't be doing that either. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Marie. Uh, Bible study and social time at KTV United Church, Tuesdays at 1.30 p.m. This is an informal time for making new friends, conversation and learning, and everyone is welcome. If you are unable to attend in person, um, we also enjoy our time together on Facebook. So there is a phone number here. You can call Janice 
at um, at the office on Thursdays. And Linda, where's Linda? You would have the phone number if somebody called the office. Absolutely. Okay. And now I'm going to uh, turn it over to Jana, and she's going to do our land acknowledgement.
come to the call of worship. Times are changing. Times are changing. In the midst of change, you are the strong one of God, the source of courage. Times are changing. In the midst of change, you are the one long for God, the root of peace. And we'll have the lighting of the Christ candle. Thank you, Elizabeth. As we light this candle, may it mark our readiness to welcome the spirit of our loving Creator stirring within our midst. Welcome, Janice. I'm coming. <laughs> That's quite all right. We're saving the prayer of confession for you. <laughs> In scripture, God declares, before you call, I will answer. While you are yet speaking, I will hear. Know, the, know that no matter what we have done, God hears us, God forgives us, and God loves us. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today, we're doing the Congregational Covenant with the new council and trustee members. And I would like to call on our co-chairs to come forward during their next hymn, Make Me In Your Life. We'll be singing just the first two verses, and then we'll continue from there. And we'll just join, don't forget your mask. Don't get all the way up there and then, yes. So, bathe me in your light, oh God.
this, this will be our, or is our vice chair. And Linda Torbison, our secretary. Diane Tribe uh, is treasurer. She, she's elected at uh, the annual gen general meeting each year. Uh, Gwen Reeves as observer. John Jones as observer. Uh, Greg Dufton, who's unable to attend today, trustee. Joella McKay, trustee. And Lindsay Tribe, trustee.
is wonderful to the council members and that life continues. It is a wonderful example of life happening within this congregation and that is not always happening everywhere that you go. Don't take for granted what you have here. And let us join together as we, pre as we repeat the words to our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created, who has come to us in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and to make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, and life in death and life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. So now they're leaving the temple. 
And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones, what a wonderful building. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, and Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be a sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they may lead many astray. And when you hear of wars, rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. They must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. And so ends this gospel reading. Loving Creator, I pray now that the words I speak, the meditations of my heart, and those that listen will be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Well, growing up in the 60s, there was a lot of background noise. There was a lot of talk about the Iron Curtain. Failsafe, movies like that, the Cuban Missile Crisis, oh, there was the attack of the 50-foot woman, I love that one, Monkeys in Space, The Day the Earth Stood Still, The Doomsday Clock. What was real and imagined was difficult to separate as a child. It all contributed to the belief that the end of the world could happen any moment. I recall hearing my father, I was coming downstairs and I stood behind the wall when I heard what they were talking about just in the doorway. And it must have been sometime around the Cuban Missile Pride Crisis because he was talking about bomb shelters and what was the sense of a bomb shelter, were they, would they do any good, and if they did, was he capable of doing what they said you had to do? And that was shut the door and not allow your neighbors inside. It was just you and your family. As I listened into the doorway, I heard my dad decide that he would just rather go down with the rest than have to worry about turning away people. I didn't understand it at the time, but I know now that that speaks volumes to the character that my father was. This idealistic time of the childhood in the 60s was also a time of civil unrest, the arms race, the Cold War, and all the while the doomsday clock was ticking. A few years ago, Probably just before COVID started, that Christmas, I was up visiting my son in Ottawa and the entire family decided to take a tour of the Diefenbaker to a bomb shelter, I forget what it's called, but it was that place, the bunker, that's the word, the bunker. And we went down into this bunker and we went down this long hallway and there was rooms full of computers that were just massive size of many bathrooms was a single computer, and there was a lot of them. And there was a special radio room that would give up the um, emergency announcement because they figured that was the only place that there might still be that announcement capable of coming out from the government. By the end of the tour, we finished up with a picture of the do actual doomsday clock. And I think it was set at about three minutes to maybe five to. And they said it's moved up a few notches since then. I thought there's not many notches left to move up. They also explained.
claim that this bunker would be deemed worthless in today's technology, that a bomb would come in seeking and would be able to move, maneuver its way around through the tunnels that we had to walk in and down the elevator till it found its target. We are still living in precarious times. In my early teens, I was the first time I attended an evangelical type of church. And it was the first time I heard quite in this way about God's judgment and the four horsemen of the apocalypse and the battle of Armageddon. Now what I heard personally was that God was going to destroy the world with bombs and I didn't have to worry about little green men and serve some crazed guy with a finger on the button. Now that's what I heard. I'm not saying that's what they said, but that's what I heard. You know, when I think about it, between you and me, it's no wonder there was such a drug problem in the 70s. <laughs> I was well into my adulthood before I was able to shed that fear of God's wrath and the judgment of the world coming at any minute. Now what I did grow to understand, and it helped a lot, was that during the 60s that the adults too were attempting to deal with the whole process. The world was indeed a scary place. In the 50s and the 60s, the adults were attempting to come to terms with weapons of mass destruction. And they were planted all over the world and they were aimed at us. The threat was real. And the face of a man on the moon changed with one small step for mankind. As we gazed up at that full moon one hot July night. It was during the 60s that people, they were putting their faith in God. That God's reign would happen. They were hoping for it to accelerate. And it's understandable. There was a desire, there was a need, a real need for some control in their lives. My hope is that today as individuals, as a church, that we are no longer looking for a way to run away or escape with God as our judge, but have moved to a place of healing with God as our traveling companion and teacher, our hope. I believe it's a safer place to rest. Now, if I want to be cranky, I can say, do you remember what we talked about last week? I've given you a few hints. As you recall, it was about the widow's might. I like to refer to her as the mighty widow. And when Jesus asked the disciples to take notice of the widow, they, the disciples, they were busy watching the Sadducees show. And it was a pretty grand show. But the problem was with all the show, they were busy watching, and it was that they missed this quiet widow come in and deposit her two coins. She literally gave everything she had. And Jesus wasn't saying, be like her. He was saying, notice her. Look at her. Today's reading from Mark picks right up after where we left off last week. The disciples are leaving the temple, and they are marveling at the majesty of it all, the grandeur. Now I could spend the entire hour, not just the reflection time, but the whole hour talking about how amazing the temple was. Now, legend has it that it was constructed in three years, but other sources say that it probably took much, much longer, decades. I believe that something like 46 years seemed to be concise with what people were agreeing on. 
they tried to build it as a replica of Solomon's temple, which was destroyed when the Babylonians came in and they, did, they ransacked it. They got everything, they took all the gold, they took everything, but they didn't get the um, Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. They disappeared and are never spoken of again at that point. I personally like to think that somebody like Indiana Jones is going to find them somewhere. I think they're scrolled away someplace safe. I just think that would be the most amazing story. When we read about the Temple of Solomon, the inside ceiling was 180 feet long, 90 feet wide, 50 feet high. The highest point of King Solomon's Temple was actually 120 cubits tall, about 20 stories. Now the double gate of Herod's wall going into the Temple Mount was 210 feet the stairway. Each stair was a different height and width so that you didn't just run up them. They were done on purpose like that so that you would enter into this and climb these stairs in prayer. To set your mind right, they, this is probably where the first part of this discussion happened was on those steps. They say that the probability is that that talk that Jesus gave when he was 12 years old, when they couldn't find him, he was in the temple, probably took place somewhere near these steps. It's not on the steps themselves. The disciples marveled at this temple. Now we have Joseph, uh, or Josephia, Jophus, Jophias, I'm terrible with names. Now he was a Jewish historian, he was there when the temple was destroyed, he's seen it in all his glory, and he, this is how he describes it. Viewed from without, the sanctuary had everything that could amaze either the mind or eyes, overlaid all around the stout plates of gold, the first rays of the sun reflected so fierce a blaze of fire that those who endeavored to look at it were forced to turn away as if they looked straight at the sun. To strangers as they approached, it seemed in a distance like a mountain covered with snow. For any part that was not covered with gold was dazzling white. There is so much gold on this temple that when the Romans conquered Jerusalem and were destroying it, taking apart and getting the bounty, they melted the gold off the temple, and there was enough gold that had built the Colosseum. That's how they, that was what gave them the money to build the Colosseum in Rome. And in today's prices, the Colosseum would have cost hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And that was taken from the gold of the temple. And they saved some of the better artifacts the things like the menorah, the and artifacts that they thought were just too pretty. They marveled at it. I can marvel, and I go to Toronto once in a while. I don't get there very often, and I'm still, if I'm downtown, I'm looking up. What stones take our attention away? Is it the stone of wealth, our possessions, the stone of accomplishment, the stone of influence, the stone of being loved? What stones do you consider so important that it takes our attention away? We have misplaced hope into power. We've misplaced our hope and placed it in the money and the might. Life is still chaotic. And in spite of all the technologies and the scientific advances, people in our world are still oppressed. They are still starving. It hasn't changed. The temple, that formidable, massive, stunning building, this place that was this place of worship, the place for the Holy of Holies. And Jesus tells them,
and not a single stone will be left on top of another. It's all going to be coming tumbling down. And indeed, 40 years later, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. I got pages and pages here. I was so impressed. Like I said, we'd be here all morning. And Jesus told them, it's all coming tumbling down. There will be wars and rumors of war, famines and earthquakes. It's all going to continue. And indeed, they have. Since we've been watching the news, reading the papers, or turning on our iPhones now, famines, wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes, it still continues. And through it all, we're still looking for the second coming of Jesus. He seems no closer than the first time I ever thought about it. And stayed awake at night in fear. In spite of this apocalyptic vision that Jesus himself declares, we are not alone in how we respond. As frightening as this world is, and it is a scary place, it's a fearsome days we are living in. We have learned that our strength is not in the things of this world. That is not where we find our hope. Our strength, even when the worst happens, and it will happen, our certainty is the fact that no matter what, we are called to fix our eyes on Jesus. That we are called to be a people with hearts that are open, with minds that are on what God may be doing. And whatever the future holds, whatever it is, God's love, God's grace is present. Our United Church Creed that we repeated this morning tells us that we are not alone. It's the first line. We are not alone. How powerful is that? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and to make new, who works in us, in us, and in others, by the Spirit. We trust in God, and we are called we are called to be a church, to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live and respect the creation, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, no matter how afraid we are of what's going to happen in the apocalypse after we're dead, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. This is our creed. This is what we believe. Let us pray. Gracious and loving creator, we thank you for your unconditional and totally accepting love. A love that asks us to do the best we can, 
to embraces us with warmth and encouragement when we stumble and when we fall. Help us, O oh God, to announce that love to those whom we love. Help us to show that love to all. God of light, source of all that is, be with us in our hearts and in our minds. Be with us upon our lips and in our actions. And when we see the world is falling apart, help us to remember that you are still in charge of all things. And that your hand has brought us safe this far. And help us and encourage us to help and encourage others during their hours of trial. Loving Creator, hear the silent prayers upon our heart. be with us as you hear us repeat the prayer that your son taught us to say our father who art in heaven how would be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I need the every hour, 671, every hour of every moment. I like to say I chit-chat with God throughout the day. Every hour, God is with us.
We gather our offerings as a portion of our living and our time, our ideas and prayers for each other. Grant us God the grace of giving.